Well, hello everyone and welcome to this exciting hands-on lab. My name is Aaron Dawson. I'm a writer on Oracle's DevRel team and we're excited about this one because it's the first time Red Bull racing Honda and Oracle are teaming up for something like this. And really, what is this? Why are you here? Well, over the next two hours or so, you'll be configuring a machine learning model in the form of a J Hipster app running on OCI, predicting the top five drivers of a race using race data. I know that's a lot, but uh, we're going to get through it together. This is the beginner's lab. So we don't expect you to know much about machine learning at all. In other words, there's no need to feel nervous or anything. And as you get to know the basics, including tuning and setting up a virtual machine using Terraform and containers, our panelists will be available if you get stuck. And to take even more pressure off, um, a lot of what you'll be doing today has some automation to it. In other words, your hands won't be so mired in code that you'll need to take a shower afterwards, right? Think of this more uh, as a demo of one very specific thing you can do with OCI. So for now, you should have some documentation walking you through your time with us. You can find this in an email you should have received yesterday. Uh, if you can't find it or for some reason didn't get the email, we'll go over everything. Uh, but just to jump ahead a little bit, uh, the first thing you'll be doing today is signing up for a free tier OCI account. Afterwards, you'll deploy a stack in your OCI tenancy. Before we get to that, though, uh, here are some resources which will help you through the day. And I'll leave the slide up for a moment or two for you to navigate to those URLs and get set up. Right, so like I mentioned, you first need to sign up for a free tier account with OCI. Uh, you may have already done this if you received an email from us yesterday linking out to the free tier sign up page. Um, but if not, that's okay because Oracle's own Victor Martin assembled this handy video, which is going to walk you through the sign up process. If you want to watch the video, awesome. Great. If not, no pressure. Go straight to the lab guide to find documentation covering how to create your free tier account and stack. So I'll go ahead and play this and check in with you afterwards. Hi, I'm Victor Martin from Oracle Cloud. I'm going to walk you through the steps to sign up for an Oracle Cloud free tier. Please follow along and pause the video when you need it. Oracle Cloud Free Tier gives you a set of always free cloud services. These services will be available forever to autonomous databases, to virtual machines, up to four ARM processors virtual machines. You will also have a load balancer, block, object, and archive storage, monitoring, and much more. As part of your Oracle Cloud Free Tier, you will also have a 30 days trial with free credits to use in other services from Analytics to Kubernetes. Sounds good, isn't it? Are you signing up for an upcoming workshop with us? Please make sure that you use the same email you use for the registration, as we have activated a special offer and you won't need your credit card to sign up. In any case, Oracle Cloud is not going to charge you for your trial. You actually have to explicitly tell us so when you are happy with all the Oracle Cloud services after your trial. Let's dive in. You need to add your country. Then your first and last name. You also have to provide your email. Oracle Cloud has to check you are a human by asking you to resolve an easy challenge. Finally, click verify my email to move to the next step. If your email has been activated for the offer, you will see the special Oracle Offer pop-up window with the type of offer already selected. Then click Select Offer. All the initial information is already in. 
Now you have to provide a strong password. I use a generated one, but you can select any you like. Just make sure you are in compliance with the strong password pattern. Confirm the password by typing it again. Fill the company name if apply. The cloud account name is essential as it is a unique identifier for your account. Select a name you like that is not taken. The home region is the region where you are more likely to deploy resources. You can deploy to other regions by subscribing to them. However, your free trial only supports one region. Select a region geographically close to you if you are not sure. I'm selecting Frankfurt region. At the bottom, click continue. Fill the address information with city, postcode, county and your phone number. Click continue. The final step is to accept the agreement and click start my free trial. Oracle Cloud starts provisioning your account. This takes on average one minute or two. Then you are going to be redirected to the Oracle Cloud web console. Can you see the message? Your account is currently being set up. It means that some services will still be unavailable for a few more minutes. Just keep it in mind. When Oracle Cloud fully provisions your account, you will receive an email. I will show you that in a few seconds. Go to the menu to explore Oracle Cloud services. Also, the search bar is a friendly tool as you can search for compute instances, Kubernetes engine, analytics services, cost tools, user management, autonomous databases, Apex instances, and much more. On the right side, you will see the region you selected when you sign up. The next icon is CloudCell, a small free Linux instance with several tools pre-installed and configured like OCI CLI and languages like Java, Node, Python, and more. You can close CloudCell now. Confirm with exit. The next one is announcements for updates from Oracle Cloud. The following is the help icon, where you can find documentation links, chat with us, post questions in our forums, and finally, create a support request and request a limit increase. The next icon is to change the language. And the final one is the profile icon, where you can see your user information, your tenancy, and the sign out button. After a while, the message saying that your account is being set up will disappear. After a few minutes, you will also receive a getting started email and another one when your trial account is fully provisioned. Use the button in the email to sign in whenever you want in the future. You are all set up to enjoy your new Oracle Cloud account. Happy hacking! Okay, uh, that is really energetic music uh, if you're uh, in the AM like I am, but that's okay. We're all awake now. Um, thank you Hi. so much, Victor, for that. Um, all right, everyone. So now that you're signed up for your account, you'll need to deploy a stack on OCI for your Jupyter Lab environment. And this can take about 10 or 15 minutes, which is why we're going to do this at the top here. And while you're waiting for OCI to do its thing in the background, I'll review what we're doing today and then we can get into the good stuff. So let's start that process. So when you open the lab guide, which you'll see as a GitHub readme markdown file accessible through that URL you see at the top of the slide here, you'll notice this handy button here to deploy to Oracle Cloud. Go ahead and click that. Not a ton to do on this page, but you'll want to pay attention to one important step. Um, toggle the checkbox to ensure that you've accepted the terms of use. Go ahead, just make sure that's checked it's pretty easy. Then click Next. For the second step, again, not much to do here, click next. And if you see an option to input an SSH key, you can just bypass that, click next. And for the third and final step, check the run apply box, then click create. And after clicking create, OCI will do its thing. And this is when your stack will take a little time to 
bake in the oven, um, that is totally normal. So while your stack is setting up, let's take a quick glance at what we're doing today from a really high level. So to train our model, we of course need to collect data. Uh, this data set in particular was gathered from airgast.com and spans many, many races for multiple drivers. Hey, After, Terrence, excuse Terrence, me. Uh, yeah, this is Manish. Can you, can you go a little slower? Uh, we have a global audience and they want you to go a little bit slower. Oh, happy so, to sorry. do that. Happy to do that, happy to do that. And, and you know what, I have a feeling because I saw a few folks raising their hand, I still do. I have a feeling that maybe I went through the, um, the setup pretty quickly. So I'll just go through that again, just, just for, for safe measures. Um, so, okay, great. So again, this is that, that first step. And here's the URL where you wanna navigate to. Uh, when you when you see this GitHub README file, there's this special little button here you'll want to click. And in a new tab, uh, you'll see this first step. You'll see the three steps on the left nav here. And this first one, all you really want to do, all you really want to pay attention to is to check the terms of use after, you know, reading them, of course, maybe perusing them. And then you'll click next. And it's here again where there's not a lot to do. Um, and if you see an option to input an SSH key, uh, you can just bypass that and click next. And for this third step, uh, the important takeaway here is that you click the run apply checkbox. Go ahead and toggle that. After you click create, that's when you're going to see OCI kind of thinking and setting up your stack for what you're going to be doing today. And so I hope going over that a second time was 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 uh, was was good for uh, folks who who might have. Um, I was going a little quickly, so thank you, Manish, for calling that out. Okay, cool. And while that's setting up in the background, I just thought um, we'd review what we're doing today. And as I was saying before, you know, this first step, it's all about data collection. It's hard to train a machine learning model without this very important first step. So that's what uh, Nacho is going to start with today. And after your data is gathered, you'll organize it into a data set using Jupyter Notebooks. In the data analysis stage, you'll run some reports and start to make some decisions about the model given the available data. The implementation stage, this is where the proverbial rubber meets the road. And this is the part that you can, you know, officially start bragging to your friends about how you spent part of your day. Almost in the home stretch here, this fifth stage sees your ML model really churning out data that you've trained it to make decisions about. And for the last step, you'll want an actual UI to provide a, provide a way to predict those top five drivers that I mentioned at the top. And it's at this stage where your models produce some brilliant insight, right? But how do you then paint it on the page? So this last step connects front end to back end by allowing user input whose variables query the model returning results in your app. Right. All right, that's it. Those are the six big swaths of steps here. Um, this is the 10,000 feet in the air version of what you'll be doing today. And if we want to zoom in, if we want to say get I don't know, 5,000 feet in the air. You can also think about what you're doing today in terms of the notebooks that you'll be using. And this might look like gobbledygook right now, but by the end of our time together, I promise this will make a lot more sense. Right. Okay, excellent. So by now, hopefully your stack may be finished deploying. 
And if it hasn't finished applying yet, that's totally okay. Just give it a few more minutes. Um, if it has finished, go ahead and choose Red Bull HOL from the compartment dropdown. I'll give that a second to breathe. So after you've chosen Red Bull HOL from that, from that dropdown, there's one important call out to highlight here. And that's that the public IP is where the entire lab runs. Go ahead and copy this IP on your machine and paste it into your browser as a URL. And don't navigate to it quite yet. And I'm just looking at the clock here and it might not have been 10-ish minutes for your stack to deploy yet. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a pause here and let OCI do its thing and give it a couple more minutes. Hopefully the setup is going well for you. And even if it's going perfectly, sometimes it could take a few minutes, right? So I'll just let that breathe for a little bit. Just give it another minute or two, just to let things settle in and set up. Okay, hopefully that's been enough time for your stack to deploy. Um, and it might be worth letting you know that if you just signed up for a new account, it might take some time to fully sync before you can do the stack install. And so I'm just getting breaking news right now. Uh, that that's the case. So I want to be sure that, you know, all of you can follow along with Nacho. Um, one of the, uh, one of the colleagues, one of my colleagues on the 
DevRel team who's going to be going through the bulk of this hands-on lab with you. And just to ensure that you have everything set up, I'm going to step away for five, maybe 10 minutes, play some beautiful piano etudes probably, and then I'll check back with you in about five or 10 minutes just to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Okay, talked with you then.
Hey everyone, thank you for sticking with us through the fits and starts. We just wanna make sure that everyone is on the same page and can follow along. And for those who had uh, some technical difficulties, it's uh, worth mentioning that for failed jobs, you can navigate the following through the following route. You can go to the, the hamburger menu, then developer resources, resource manager, and jobs. And it's there that you can view any jobs that have failed and potentially delete and restart uh, and just start fresh. Um, so for the few of you who have run into, into that snag, uh, it's worth trying that. Uh, but it's also worth mentioning here that the lab guide uh, will always be available for anyone who did have technical difficulties. So that'll be there for you, waiting for you in perpetuity, I hope. And I'll go ahead and pick up where I left off. As I said, if your job finished, you can choose this option from the compartment field. And there's one important highlight that I wanted to mention again, and that's that the public IP is where the entire lab runs. So go ahead and copy this IP to your local machine and paste it into your browser as a URL, but don't navigate to it quite yet. Um, again, if you don't see any of this information on your page, that's okay, just refresh and it should show up. In your URL where you've pasted that IP, type what you see here, and that's colon eight zero zero one and navigate to it. And after you navigate to that IP, you'll be taken to the Jupyter Lab sign up screen. And when prompted, you can use the information you see in this screenshot to log in. And so you'll just see a password field, go ahead and input Red Bull one, all one word, R is uppercase, to access the Jupyter Lab. And once you're in, you should see this kind of dashboard. Um, and just to ensure, just to ensure that you're in the Red Bull dash analytics dash HOL directory highlighted in the screenshot. Okay, so uh, let me let me just go over that again very quickly. So you'll want to snag this IP that you see in uh, in OCI, and then put it into your browser and paste colon eight zero zero one. Navigate to that. You'll see this field. Go ahead and pop your password in there, and you'll see this. And again, you want to. Uh, navigate to the Red Bull dash analytics dash HOL directory. Okay, great. So that is it for the setup. I know with these things, it sometimes feels like setting up is, is the hardest part. Um, but for right now and the remainder and most of the remainder of our time today, you'll be in the competent hands of my colleague on Oracle's DevRel team, Nacho Martinez. Nacho, I'm going to cease sharing and hand this over to you. Thank you, Erin. Um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see this? Looks great. Oh, great, thank you. So, um, thank you, thank you, Erin. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be uh, responsible to, to explain now the Jupyter Lab component of this Ansel Lab. <clears throat> If anyone has had issues, you can ask in the Slack channel as well. If your deployment failed, don't worry, you, you will be able to go through the lab with me step by step, and then we can reproduce on your own later on, don't worry. So make sure your, your OCI account has finished setting up before you start to deploy the image in case someone is still having problems with that. And also I'm, I'm seeing a question from Ramesh in the chat. Uh, just wanted to clarify that the lab guide and the recording for the whole session will be available afterwards for those who have technical difficulties. 
and were unable to follow along. So don't worry, okay? Um, so as, as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, um, we should all have these files and directories. Uh, inside them are either the notebooks that implement the machine learning models that we're gonna learn about, or some notebooks that are used to extract and, and, and process and build our, our data set. So right now, remember that we just log into JupyterLab using our compute instance IP address <clears throat> and port 8001, okay? This is my IP address, don't connect to it because it's mine. Uh, you should do this, but with your own IP address, right? Um, and, and we see here in this in this uh, introduction guide that we can create new Python notebooks, and we can also open up terminals just if just as if we were in a in an in a Unix operating system. The underlying operating system, if anyone is curious, is Oracle Linux, and you have access to the terminal if you if you need to install a special Python libraries or or maybe. Um, you want a Python library that isn't available in the standard package managers, or maybe you need to create directories, manage your files and everything. So just like uh, any Unix operating system, right? So, but we're not gonna need this right now. So don't worry about this. I just wanted you to know that it's available for you. Uh, the files have already provided, have, have been provided to you by us, uh, but we will need to use a, a terminal later on in more detail. I will guide you through it, don't worry. Uh, so for now we see that, that we have a couple of directories and, and files created for us. Um, uh, this was automatically created by a Terraform script that allowed us to automatically deploy this Jupyter server in OCI on port 8001 and the necessary files for the Hanson lab in, in the compute instance, right? So. What do we need to do? The first thing we need to do is go to the Red Bull Analytics hands-on lab directory. And inside this directory, we will see three notebooks in the beginners lab from scratch directory. We will see four notebooks, but we are mainly gonna use these three. And um, we will use this, these notebooks to download data from Ergast, as Erin explained before and we will create our processed CSV files. And we will focus first on the, on the data processing part, okay? Uh, these notebooks are on from scratch directory, remember? If, if someone already has access to their, to their compute instance. For the first notebook is this one, right? We want to extract data from Ergast. Ergast has a, a developer API which is an experimental web service that provides historical data for historical raising data for non-commercial purposes. And we will use this API to extract our data set from them, right? So in this part, we will process our Formula One data sets. We create a very, very simple data structure to begin with, which is our races Data, uh, data structure. And each race should be characterized by the season when it happened, uh, some geographical information, the latitude and longitude, the date and the country when, when an event happened, and a URL for, for additional information that we'll, we will use later on to pull weather information on the racing event. It will be Wikipedia, a Wikipedia URL referring to, to the racing event. So um, we, we get the, the racing information using the, the requests library. Uh, it's a very common Python library. And we get this information for every race present between 1950 and 2021. And we process all the information that the API, that the API gives us to, to encapsulate it into our racing object that, that we created before. And uh, at the beginning, this, this is the structure of our, of our data set after creating it from Ergas and processing it. We have a total of 1,034 races in our data set. 
And what we will do, first of all, is just save it into a CSV file, and then we will worry about it later, right? Um, and we do the same for, for, for each of the rounds in each of the races, and save it to another data structure, which will be a rounds data structure, right? Um, and, um, well, the difference uh, that we see with uh, the, the results, the, the Formula One results, is that this object is, is gonna be helpful for us because it's, it's gonna have every, every race broken down to account for the performance of each one of the individual drivers inside the race, right? So we will have one row per driver in each one of the races. And, and we see here that we have much more, much, many more rows in our data that we did before. Now we have about 24,000 rows. Uh, since we have the data broken down by, by drivers in races, right? And what do we do after processing this? We also save it into another CSV file. Um, now we will do the same, but we will extract the driver standings from Ergast. And um, this, what, why do we want it? Well, it will allow us to check how well a driver is doing after a specific round in a season. So basically this will account for the cumulative points that they have had at a specific point in time in a season, right? How well they are doing. And we will also save it to a CSV file for later. And here below we do the same, but with constructors, right? Constructors are the, a Formula One team is composed of one driver or two drivers or as many drivers as you want, and the constructor, which is the, the team behind uh, everything, the engineers and everything. And we also want to extract the constructor standings the same way we did with the drivers, right? So now that, that we have a, a picture of the, of the Formula One air gas data, we complement this information with we want to complement this information with, with weather data for all races the same way we did before. And for that, we're going to go to our second notebook, weather data collection. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm not reading the, the questions right now, but you can ask on in chat. My, my colleagues will help you. And if there is something that you need me to stop, just tell me, please. Um, the, the difference with, with weather data collection, remember that I said that we were going to extract this information from Wikipedia. Well, how are we going to do this? We are not going to use the, web, the Wikipedia API. We are actually going to use uh, Selenium, which is a, a web crawling library that allows us to get information directly from a website using HTML and, and CSS tags. And, and uh, well, this is the, the, the Selenium code. Uh, using the URLs for each one of the races, um, we parse the Wikipedia websites to get the kind of weather conditions in, in each one of the races. So, for example, in, in Silverstone in 1950, we had a, a sunny, mild, and dry weather. We extracted this information with Selenium, right? Uh, you have two, two possibilities to execute the Selenium code. You, you can execute this uh, using a, a browser mode, with, and you need that graphical user interface to execute this, but you also have a headless mode and you don't, you don't need to, to have a web browser to extract this information. We actually used uh, uh, the graphical user interface uh, mode if you're interested in knowing. So to, to facilitate uh, the processing of, of our weather data, there are many, many, many categories as you can see here, like there are many differences. Soledad, or clear, warm, hot, sunny, fine, mild, sereno. But we don't care about uh, all these categories, right? Uh, we want to simplify a little bit our weather variable uh, in order not to have so many categories. We don't care if it was damp, wet, or the kind of rain that happened. We just want to, we just want to know if it rained and if the racing grounds were wet. Uh, so we simplify all these categories that Wikipedia has into five categories to, to simplify our variable, right? So mm, we, we create uh, some kind of uh, binary variables for each one of them. So for example, if it was warm, 
and dry, then we will have a one zero, one zero, zero here, where we are like binarizing our variable. And uh, right, right here, what we do is just add this information into our weather object and then save it for later into another CSV file in, in the data directory as well, right? Weather.csv, that's what we do. So right now, remember that we are just extracting, extracting, extracting data, but we're not doing anything yet with data. Uh, we will get to that, to that part later on, don't worry. And um, well, finally, the last piece of information that, that we'll get from, from Ergast is this uh, qualifying data collection. So we are assuming that, that quali qualifying data is, is an important factor on determining and predicting future results for a driver, right? For example, if a very skilled driver uh, always, always qualifies since the beginning of their career, it will probably mean that in the future, most likely they will also qualify for races. So that's why we wanna extract qualifying data and include it into our existing data set, right? And uh, we do the same. Uh, we are actually using the, the Selenium library as well to extract data from this URL, formula1.com, which is actually, actually the Formula One uh, official website. And we process it using Selenium again to get the finishing times for all drivers and complementary information about their car and their grid position in a race. So for example, here we can see Derek, Derek Warwick finished fifth on round one on the 1983 season with, with his Toman hard car. And his finishing time, his qualifying time was one minute and 35 seconds. Remember that this time is the qualifying time, right? So the qualifying race, I will explain this later, but a qualifying race, you just get the, the, the best lap time. And this is the, the lap time that you qualify with to the actual, to the actual race. Um, and what do we do as, as, as always? We save it into another CSV file and we will use this, this, this data, don't worry. Um, okay, so now we are not gonna extract more information from Airgas because we, we already have many CSV files with, with, with data, but let's make a recap, right? We have extracted data from Airgas and we have extracted data from Wikipedia also for the weather. And uh, now what do we wanna do? Well, we have many files with, with different sets of data, but we would like to, to join this information, right? We would like to, to merge this information into one uh, unique file or data set that we could feed it to our machine learning model in order to train it, right? So uh, we will move to, to, to our next part, which is data preparation. As Erin explained, this is the second part. We need to prepare our data to, to feed it to the machine learning model. And, and now we, in this, in this notebook, it's very simple. We, we just try to join all the data sets that we previously processed into one. And for that, um, we will go to this notebook. It's on the beginner's directory. We exited the from scratch directory. We're not using this one anymore. And we go to data preparation. We're gonna to try to merge the data sets. Mm. So here, what do we do? Basically, we load all the CSV files that we processed before, and then we will try to join them into one with the merge function. Where do we do this? Right here. We merge all, all, this, uh, all these CSV files into one. We will do an, an inner join based on, on the season, the round, and the circuit ID. Uh, if, you, if you know about relational databases, then you will have heard about inner joins. Um, and one by one, we will, we will join our data sets, the weather data set, the result, the driver standings, the constructor standings, and the qualifying driver data, right? Which were the five data sets that we had. And we get something like this. This is uh, all the, the columns that we want from all the, from all the CSV files into one object. And we will do some additional calculations of our own, right? We wanna calculate the age of the drivers. Why? Why do we wanna calculate the age of the drivers? Because 
we are pulling data from 1950, right? So maybe there were some, some drivers that were very popular and very good at 1950, but now what they are dead. We don't want to make a prediction on them because they're not going to be able to race on, on a 2021, 2022 uh, race. So we want to, we want to drop the all drivers whose date of birth is too high to compete, right? And we will also do some data processing part. Uh, we will drop the nulls, the null values and, and the invalid numbers uh, because it wouldn't make sense to include it into our machine learning model. It's just gonna confuse the models, right? Um, we will also convert uh, our weather variables into booleans. This is just a, a Python standard. We wanna use booleans instead of, uh, for example, strings to represent this. And uh, we will calculate also the difference in qualifying times between the drivers in this, in this code. So after all this processing, we can see here the result again, including the variables that we just uh, created, right? There are many, many more uh, columns right here. We will be able to see all of them later on but we will also include the age of the driver and everything that we just processed. Mm, and now I think that we have a good data set to begin with. Um, if you have uh, any questions, just tell me, okay? But um, I'm, gonna, um, I'm gonna move on to the exploratory data analysis part, right? So why do we wanna explore the data that we have? We have all the data into one file, but now we want to know what's going on inside inside the data. Maybe we can extract some insights from ourselves and make some hypotheses about the data that we have. So, in order to do that, uh, we can go into this file in the from scratch directory. It's called exploratory data analysis. And as Erin explained before, this is part three of the machine learning pipeline, as 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 you would call it. It's very important that when you are a data scientist or you're planning on, on working with data, the data extraction and preparation and understanding your data maybe takes about 85% of the time in, 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 in your whole career. So we're going we're gonna to see what, what's going on in, in our data, right? So I'm going to give a, a little Formula One history to to you to, so that you can understand what's going on in the data. Um, since 2014, the, the, constructors, uh, the constructor that has dominated the scene is Mercedes-Benz with uh, Hamilton as, the, as their star, as the star pilot, right? And the, the performance of constructors are dependent on regulations set by the FIA, which is a Formula Association, Formula One Association or something like that. Um, and since 2013, uh, a new regulation was made. And, and, and since 2013, we have something that's called the hybrid era. And after Mercedes-Benz, um, Red Bull Racing has followed its, its steps with Ferrari. So they are the top three, Mercedes, Red Bull, and, and uh, Ferrari. They're the top three since 2013, basically. So, after 2022, the, the rules will change. So next year, the FIA will make some changes into the rules. So whichever analysis we do here today, it will be valid only until 2022 because uh, the constructor's rules will change. They will, uh, um, maybe they have some specifications about the weights of the car and everything. And maybe it will change the, the, the podiums. So our data set will have to be modified in, in uh, next year to, to accommodate these changes as well, right? So we also need to, to understand how a Grand Prix is structured. A Grand Prix is what you know as a Formula One event. And a Grand Prix is structured in three parts. Uh, we can call these parts uh, Q1, Q2, and Q3, right here, Q1, Q2, and Q3. And as I, you can, you can uh, read as, I, as I'm telling you this, but, um, Q1 is also called the practice session. It's the first, uh, the first race. The, um, the qualifying session is Q2, and the actual race, which happens on Sundays, is Q3. So in Q1, 
uh, there will be some disqualified uh, disqualified drivers. The worst five drivers, the drivers with the, with uh, the five drivers with the worst times, will be disqualified in Q1. And then we will have uh, well, a Formula One race has twenty drivers, right? So if five five of them are disqualified, then we will have fifteen drivers that will move on to to Q2, which which is a qualifying session. And the best ten drivers out of these fifteen drivers will get another chance at Q1. And they will compete for a better starting position, uh, a better starting position in Q3, which is the race. So how that's how the, the grid of a race is determined. You have like two chances if, if you're not disqualified at the beginning. So in Q3, in the actual Sunday race, uh, that's, uh, that's that we all like, uh, the best 10 drivers out of the out of the remaining 15 drivers they will get points and the top three will get the podium and um, since 2010 uh, has been a, a really important year considering the FIA regulations that we talked about um, we will only consider data in this exploratory data analysis only after 2010 so we will have data from 2010 up to 2021 which is this year we haven't finished the year, but we have some data from 2021 already. Um, <clears throat> so since uh, some constructors changed the name, uh, have changed their name since the beginning of, of, of Formula One, we, we have to unify unify their names by updating them to the newest names. That's, that's the first thing that we have to do. We have to update the names. So for example, uh, Alpine F1 uh, is, the, is the new name for Lotus, for example. So we have to up update this, right? And we will display also some, some information. We would like to, to display some information to, to ourselves to, to better understand uh, how things work. Um, so let me, let me see here, for example, Let's go to these visualizations. And um, I'm gonna talk about the DNF ratio, right? Uh, the DNF ratio is a ratio that, that determines if a driver did not finish a race. Um, and the, uh, the, the, defi the actual definition of the DNF ratio is the number of times that a driver has not finished a race divided by the number of races per driver. So if I haven't finished, five races out of 100, my DNF ratio will be five divided by 100, right? And the lower the ratio, the better. It means that the driver makes less mistakes, for example. Um, and here we can see uh, the DNF's ratio due to driver error, because we, we also have uh, another uh, kind of, of DNF ratio, which is constructor error, which would be mechanical issues, such as the, the engine, for, uh, engine failing, I don't know, a tire falling out of the car, anything, right? So right here, we see that, that the, the, the drivers with the least DNF ratio are, are shown here. For example, Yuki Tsunoda or, 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 or any of them, right? Um, and, and we also have here uh, uh, a visualization that, that allows us to see the DNF ratio due to the constructor error. And we can see that, remember that I said that from 2013 onwards, the top three teams were Ferrari, Red Bull, and Mercedes. And just as it happens, these are the three uh, constructors with the least DNF ratio of all the competition, which makes sense, right? So we are seeing that our data is consistent with the hypothesis and the data that, that, is, um, that we have on the internet. Right, um, and this this also accounts for the great performance in Formula One. So if if you have a great team that doesn't make any mistake and, and the, your hardware, your 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 car is perfect, doesn't all doesn't make mistakes at all, then you're gonna have a better chance of going in the podium. Right. Um, here we also have uh, visualizations, for example, to see how many points. Uh, the drivers score when they are at home. So that a home race would be where you grew up, basically your, your, 
your home uh, circuit. So for example, uh, Mark Weber is the leader together with, with Hamilton and Norris. They always, always, always score points since 2010 on their home circuit. Why? Well, maybe they grew up with, uh, they grew up in that circuit. Maybe they have practiced it. Maybe it's because they have a lot of fans on, 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 on that stage. But they, they, they do this and they're, they're great. And we can do this, this visualization as well with the podium finishes. So how many times does some driver finish in the podium at home? Well, the leader here is Mark Weber. Three out of four times since 2010, he has finished at podium at home. And we can do this uh, the same, but with the constructors. And we can see that Red Bull always or almost always, 85% of the time, uh, Red Bull, the Red Bull team finishes with points. And the same with the podium, Mercedes followed by Ferrari and Red Bull, as you can see here. So this means that our data is consistent and um, we have made a good processing so far of our data. So hopefully this, uh, this analysis uh, gives us a, a bit of an insight into the data that we have since, since 2010 and lets us have a better understanding of what we're doing so far. Um, it's 6.05. Uh, we have about 55 minutes left. Uh, I'm not sure if I should check for, for questions because I have 85 messages in chat. Um, if uh, Erin, do you think uh, I should, or Bo, do you think that we should answer questions now or should I continue? Hey Nacho, Sorry. we've been answering the questions on Slack, so you are good to proceed, but I right. think some folks may need a little time to catch up with you. Right, okay, then uh, let's, uh, let's pause if you want for, for five minutes. And I will also partake in answering questions, specific questions about what, what I have been presenting. And then we will jump into the, the machine learning part. Remember folks that if you have any questions, you can ask in the, in the Slack group. All these that, that I have explained, all these notebooks are present in the lab guide as well. So, okay, let's take a five minute break. I'm still gonna be here answering questions, but um, with my mic muted so I don't make any any silly noises, okay? Okay, uh, Dario, I'm, I'm gonna answer your question. Um, so we are using matplotlib to, to plot this, um, these things. You have to have some, uh, some idea about what grouping is. I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, relational databases, but it's pretty similar, well, for example, if we want to display the DNF ratio due to driver error, well, we have to consider the driver DNF calculation, right? So we made this calculation ourselves. This is a, a composite mathematical equation that we did before. Let me, let me see if I can find it right here, right? We calculate the DNF 
by applying a lambda function, which is a, an anonymous function for every row in our data set, we will say that the, 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 the DNF is, uh, if, if a driver has not finished a race, we will put a one in, in a new column called driver DNF. If the, style, the, if the status is one of these numbers. And how do we know these numbers? Well, there are uh, many disqualifying reasons. Each one of these numbers is uh, one reason for, for disqualifying. So for example, if you have exited, um, you have a crash. So for example, a crash will be ID three. Number four will be that the weather is too harsh to continue, et cetera, et cetera, you know? So you have, uh, if you want, I can, I can give you a documentation on, on matplotlib. It's not MATLAB. I'm going to, I'm going to, this is the library, right? Yes. It's a Python package for plots. Exactly. Yes. And uh, yes. So the, the code is, is kind of hard to, uh, to begin with. It's not very user friendly. But that's why we provide this notebook so that you can modify this to your convenience in, in future projects or, or anything, right? Um, yes, Parag, uh, Oracle Labs, we have a product called Oracle Data Science. And this is Zeppelin based, but we are actually using a Jupyter, Jupyter Lab based notebook. Um, because the data science uh, service is costs money, right? We wanted to, to make it very simple. So we, uh, we, we created, uh, so let me show you. We created, um, if I'm, I'm gonna make a recap, if someone hasn't already uh, accessed the, um, the, the notebooks. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how how to do that. So we created with a Terraform script a uh, compute instance. This is my IP. I created here. I have many many compartments, and my my compartment that I'm using. This is my public IP. So I copy this, and then I go here and I paste it. And in port eight thousand and one, we made an automatic deployment of a Jupyter Lab server. Right. Um, Gautam, uh, the prediction results for the Hungarian Grand Prix. You will be able to make this with uh, with Erin in, in at the begin at the end of the lab. You will have a user interface where you will be able to make your own. Uh, you will you will be able to make your own model with me, and you will be able to make predictions with an already trained model. Don't worry. Okay, so we, we've, we, we have been answering questions for like seven minutes. If you want, we are a, a, a bit short of time. So I'm gonna try to hurry up and continue with the machine learning part, if that's okay. So I'm gonna close the questions now. And um, I'm gonna continue. Okay, everyone ready? So remember, we made some visualizations here to to understand the data that we have. And now we wanna go into machine learning, right? This cool, cool expression that we are gonna understand what it means in a couple of minutes. So we will now execute and, and train our, our machine learning models after we have our data already processed. We understand the data, we have extracted it. So we are ready. Why do we want machine learning, right? you may ask, well, we have huge, huge amounts of information and, and data. We have like 24,000 rows before we saw, and, and machine learning allows us to make predictions using mathematical equations in ways that our brains, uh, our human brains could never understand. Right now, remember that, that the purpose of this hands-on lab is to, to predict the possible next winner or the, or the top five for any race in the future. And we will need them to, to, train, to train our model with uh, historical data that we have processed. Uh, we have a few hypotheses to base our predictions upon, right? We see here that the qualifying position of a driver 
is, is very important. Um, remember the case that I said, if a driver wins 80% of the races, it's also probable that, that they will win in the future as well. And using this idea, then we can also formulate the rest of our assumptions, uh, which, which would, would be that the, con the, the constructors and the constructors reliability, the DNF ratio for the constructors is also an important factor to consider. Also, in which race and circuit uh, where, the, where a race is happening is also very important, right? Because we see that at home, some drivers perform better, better than others because they, they are more used to, to a race or to a, to a, to a racing uh, stage than, than others. And some drivers are just better in their homes uh, at a specific circuit. And, and finally, our last assumption would be that the driver's confidence, the DNF ratio, is also important, right? So with all these things in, in mind, uh, let's let's uh, let's train six different classification algorithms, right? So we will go to our fourth notebook, and um, the the six I'm gonna name the six models that we will train, which is logistic regression, decision tree, random forest, SVM, uh, support vector vector machine, which we call SVM or SVC. Um, uh, Gaussian naive base and KNN, right? These algorithms were chosen because they are six of the, of the most reliable algorithms for, for the specific problem that we have. Uh, we have a classification problem, right? A regression problem would be if we wanted to predict a number, uh, um, but we want to predict a position, right? Uh, uh, we have a, a classification problem. We have integer. We have integers. We don't have uh, 3.6. That will not be uh, a prediction that we will make because it doesn't make sense. So these algorithms are, are all explained here in more detail. And I definitely recommend checking out the differences between each of the algorithms later on. But it's not really necessary. I just want to explain something important to understand how machine learning models work on the inside. And uh, this constitutes the difference between internal mathematical decision, the internal decision making process of a decision tree algorithm versus the, the random forest algorithm. And that's a, a thing that we call in data science bagging. Bagging is, is uh, short for bootstrap aggregation. And it's um, a decision making process that works this way, right? So for example, imagine that our machine learning model has four variables here. Um, then the, the, um, the decision tree will always create diversions on a, on a tree. And imagine this like a, like a tree in mathematics. The decision tree will make diversions and create diversions based on the feature one always, right? And then it will go deeper and deeper into, into the depth of the decision making tree considering feature two, three, and four. But random forest doesn't do this. Random forest considers uh, different input variables from the beginning. So to make decisions from the initial node, um, it takes an, a combination of random variables and it evaluates how good the precision and the prediction were, right? So for example, Random forest creates, for example, 100 trees, separate decision trees, or, or even millions of trees. And, and each one of these trees begins making decisions with different patterns and combinations of variables. So here we will start with feature two, and here we will start with feature one, and then another forest will start with feature three, four, five. It, it's all random, right? So how do we reach a consensus on a prediction? The consensus will be the most voted prediction by all the trees. So if we have 100 trees that are making predictions, and for example, 65 or 75 of them make the prediction that the next driver will be Hamilton, then that will be the solution because they will reach a consensus between all the trees before, make, before uh, showing you the solution, right? 
and that's called bootstrap aggregation. You divide and conquer, right? Which is a, a computer science term for this. So now that we understand this, we, we just we, we will go into the code. Um, so here, for example, we read the data that we had already processed before, and we recall what we had. We had all of these variables, right? Um, we have about 4,800 rows of data, more or less. And we will make um, the driver uh, confidence variable, which will be another calculation that we make, which will be just the inverse of the DNF ratio that we talked about in the, in the previous notebook, right? So the confidence is the better, the, yeah, the higher, the better. Why? Because it means that the driver is confident. It doesn't make mistakes. So we will, we will use this to, to, to include it into our, our variables in a model. And, and we will create a, a model that um, at the beginning, we only consider variables from drivers. Okay, we will get the constructors variables and then we will not use them right now. We will take our input variables that we consider in the, in the hypothesis, which is the Grand Prix name, the driver, the qualifying positions, the age of the driver, the confidence, and whether they are active or not. We just want active drivers, right? That drivers are no good to us. We don't want this. So we will create a subset of our data to only consider active drivers, okay? And, uh, and well, we begin with the machine learning part here, okay? Why do we have here an object that's called a standard scalar? And what, what is this? And what's a label encoder? Well, it's important to understand that machine learning models need only numbers, right? So we have variables in our model, for example, the, the driver's name, which is not a number. So how do we convert this number in this, this variable, this name into a number. We use several methods. There are many methods. We will use a label encoder, which will, for example, say, okay, if Mark Weber is the first pilot, then we, Mark, Weber, Mark Weber will be equal to one, okay? And Hamilton we, will be two, and Tsunoda will be three, et cetera, et cetera. And also we need to scale the numbers, the numerical variables. So for example, the position of the driver uh, will go from one to 20 in our, in our races. And we need to scale them. So for example, imagine we have a number that goes from 0 0.1 to one and another number that goes from 100 to 1 million. Maybe the mathematical decision-making process of a model will consider that the bigger the number the, the more important it is. And we have to avoid this. So we have to scale the numbers and normalize them into, into, into an, a normalized uh, data set of numbers, right? So that, that, that the random forest tree doesn't consider that one variable is more important than the other. We want all the variables to be considered in our model, right? So looking at, at the variables here that we have, uh, which variables are categorical? Uh, which variables are not numbers and which num which variables are numbers? The GP name, that's a name, right? So that will be not a number. The qualifying position is a number. The driver name is a name, it's not a number. The age is a number, the position is a number, the confidence, we just calculated it, it's a number, and the active driver is a number. So which variables do we need to encode? the non-numerical variables. So we use our label encoder for the GP name, the driver, and the GP name with the, the GP name and the driver, okay? And then for the numerical variables, we scale them. If, if, if they are very big, so for example, the age at, at the Grand Prix in days will be a very big number. We scale them down, okay? And, and, and in here, what we do is create our six objects for the six algorithms that we talked about. And um, 
and we will validate the accuracy with this function, cross file score. We will be able to validate the accuracy for, for our data, which is XD and YD. So YD will be the independent variable that we want to predict, and XD will be the dependent variables, which will be the inputs of the model. And we y, YD will be the solution that we want. We want to predict the position. So Y will have the position and, the, and XD will have the rest of the variables, okay? And we see here, uh, we see here that with the six models, 93% um, uh, accuracy uh, logistic regression is the best model right here, right? Uh, how, do, how do you split between training set and, and testing set? Well, the, the common values or the, the ratios that you can split this is 70 to 30%. So for example, 70% goes into the training mode and 30% goes to validate how well the predictions are made. But it depends entirely on the data set. Our data set is very, very simple. So I thought that 75 to 25% uh of of the data is is a good is a good uh good percentage to consider right and the model training will be will take the training set and the testing set will be used to measure the accuracy of the predictions okay and logistic regression is the best performing algorithm and right here what do we do the same but taking the drivers out of the equation. And then we will only consider the constructor variables. Why? We are creating a completely different model because maybe we want to predict which constructor will be the best in the future. And we can do this only considering the constructor variables. The, the procedure is the same as we did, OK? We also calculate the accuracy scores here. And we see that logistic regression and random forest and SVC have extremely high prediction rates. So for example, SVC has 95% accuracy, which is great, right? And, um, and, and here we will uh, have a, a little exercise if we have time later on. If we don't have time because uh, we have 35 minutes left, I, I will speed this up. But you will have an exercise to do here, which will be to create a model that considers both the drivers and the constructors variables. How will you do this? Remember that we will have the variables, which variables to consider. We will have to filter non-active drivers and non-active constructors. We will have to create our standard scaler and our label encoder to modify the variables and scale them. And we will uh, make some visualizations, OK? Um, but before that, I, 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 I want to say that it's important to understand that in these models, we are creating them. Um, there are model tuning options, which is a more advanced uh, Hanson lab. We will explain this in our next Hanson lab. Um, and these are called hyperparameters. And hyperparameters allow to change the behavior of a model. So for example, we can tell Random Forest how many trees do we want to, to make the decision using uh, the bagging uh, method that we, that we talked about, the divide and conquer method, right? So, for example, we can specify how many trees, the maximum depth of, of each one of the trees, so how far they will go down. I have an example here, right? I will show you now. Uh, and all, all the models have, uh, can have different hyperparameters that uh, can be used to, to fine tune a model. So for example, if 95% accuracy is not enough for you, you can use hyperparameters to reach almost 100% accuracy if you need. And for example, if you have a model that is not performing very well, it's maybe on the 65%. Now, I, for example, I did one model one time that had 65% accuracy, which is not great, right? So with hyperparameters, I was able to modify the accuracy scores of my model into like 85%, which was much better, right? And I'm not going to go uh, a lot into, into, into this file, but I wanted to show you this. This is a visualization that we can see. Um, well, let, let me go through this first. This is a feature importance, right? So the random forest models that we created before, remember that the decision-making process considers random sets of variables. And in the end, in the bootstrap aggregation method, 
uh, you're able to print out how important the variables are to the model mathematically. And we see here that the qualifying position is so important in the model that it's almost 80% of all the variables. So this, this variable itself alone is making like four fifths or 80% or of the decision only based on this, uh, on this variable. And then we also have a very important, uh, two very important variables, which are secondary, which are the driver confidence and the constructor reliability, which were the variables that we created. And this is very interesting, right? Um, and, and here, I just wanna say that, that the random forest, um, we can see here that a random forest tree and how it made the decisions, right? So the colors represent different variables. And, and, and we can also see differences between estimators, right? These are five different uh, random forest trees, okay? And see how the, the colors change. It means that each one of these estimators made each one of these diversions in the tree uh, differently. And also it reached a consensus on itself differently because they have a different depth. So th the depth also varies and we could print out 101 million and see the difference between, between all of them, right? Which is really, really, really interesting. And um, okay, I don't have much time. So if you want, I'm gonna show you how to do the, the drivers and constructors model. Now, everyone pay attention. This model, you have never executed, right? So uh, we have to execute the notebook from the beginning. You have to go right here on the fourth notebook and you have to execute this. Restart the kernel, then rerun the whole notebook. You have to do this. If you don't execute this, you will not have the variables like data, okay? This will take only one minute for you. Just execute this and then follow along with me. Um, we're gonna do the exercise uh, together. So for example, there are, if, if anyone uh, has problems following, you have the solution here, okay? In the beginner's directory, res, uh, the res uh, resources uh, directory, machine learning modeling solution. You have the solution here, okay? If we go down, this is the model that we will that we will create. This will be the code, but I will try to explain why why this code, okay? I don't have much time, so I'm I'm gonna show you which variables to consider. We have to consider both. The, I'm gonna start copying, and um, well. We have to consider the drivers and constructor variables. So we will take all the variables that we have, okay? So first of all, we have the GP name, the qualifying position, the constructor, et cetera, et cetera. And we will, I, sorry, this was not here. This was here, apologies. So here we take all the variables that we have in, in, the, in here, okay? We have to filter out the drivers and constructors which are not active. And we will use the AND operator for this, okay? We will take a subset of our data only with active constructors and with active drivers. What's next? We have to scale the numerical variables and encode the non-numerical variables. Which are the numerical variables and which are not the numerical variables? So. We see here that we have the non-numerical variables. We will use the label encoder as we talked about, okay? Then we will calculate the final position for each driver using the position index function. And now that we have this variable, which is the independent variable that we wanna, um, we wanna create, uh, let's go ahead and train the models. We have these six models here. So we create the objects, we execute the cross file score so that we can see the accuracy of each one of the models. And we see that 
logistic regression, it's taking longer, you see? As the model has considered more variables, it takes longer to execute. But we see here that logistic regression and SVC has the best accuracy for us, right? And we will use the matplotlib uh, library to plot this here. We see uh, the box plots that we have also, also on top, right? And how do we compare this? Uh, the, how do we compare the three models that we created? Well, we just execute this code. You have it, you have it available, and we see the CV, the confidence score for for our new model. What would happen if you wanted to use this model for the future? How to export this model? Okay. Um, uh, you have actually uh, a library called Pickle, which is um, a library that, uh, well, it's a, a, a file format that allows us to save any Python object, but it's optimized for machine learning models. Uh, so we would have to get, for example, let's say our, our logistic regression object, we would have to put it into a pickle file and then use it later on, okay? Um, I'm not gonna, not gonna go much deeper because we don't have much time, but um, if you have questions about exporting this model so, you, so that you can use it later on in your free time or at work, just uh, ask in the Slack channel. You have everything explained here in the fifth uh, notebook, okay? How to serve this machine learning model. And um, how do we deploy the models? Okay, I'm gonna make an introduction and then give way to Erin, which is gonna show you how to make your, your own predictions using uh, an already trained model, which is, which, is, uh, which is created. We have created here in the web directory, a predictor file, okay? So basically um, this model, uh, <coughs> sorry, this file, uh, is basically loading a train model that 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 you have a pickle file which contains an, a Python object with the model. This model has to to be already trained as we as we talked, and we will create a prediction method, and we will call this prediction this prediction method later. Here we will use the predict method with our input variables. And we will return the prediction to so that you can you can see it. And how do we test this? Okay, you have this uh, this test predictor Python file as well, and you can uh, you can uh, test what happened. Okay, if you want to make a custom prediction, for example, Silverstone circuit, if you execute this code, and now Erin will will show you. Uh, this code will be embedded into a, into a Flask application, a web application, and it will be automatically, you will be able to have access to this with, with simple buttons. But if you change here the circuit name, then with all, this, uh, with all these drivers available, it will make a prediction on this circuit, okay? So um, now I'm uh, not gonna go through any more um, Anything more more detailed? I will give way to Erin again, which will explain how to how to deploy and access these models in a web server, the, the Flask application that I just talked about, and how to make custom predictions for us. Uh, so thank you all, uh, Erin, and, and I'm gonna stop sharing the, the screen. Thank you all. All right, thanks, Nacho. That was really thorough. Uh, so hopefully you're still following along at home uh, because we're almost done, but not quite, right? Um, so at this point near the end of our time together, I'll kind of ferry us from reviewing these last steps to concluding today's hands-on lab. 
So let's check out what's happening here. And, and by the way, uh, this code is already written. This is more of a kind of walkthrough to explain what's going on uh, beneath the hood. So in this first call out, we see the predictor being called. And then in the second call out, we see an if, if function creating a server port to call the predictor itself. And it's important or at least interesting to note that the second callout is executed first, which after opening a server port actually calls the predictor. So let's go back to the launcher by clicking file and then new and launcher. Then click on the terminal icon you see called out in this screenshot. So it's file, new, launcher, then click on that terminal icon. So running the all important start command in the, in the call out here launches the, the web server. And if you need uh, to stop the server for any reason, uh, use the stop command you see in the call outs. There aren't many use cases where this would be helpful uh, to do during this particular lab. Um, but it's just it's just good to know, right? Awesome. So now you can try out all the work you did with Nacho a few minutes ago. Uh, go ahead and choose which track and whether you'd like to see reflected in your top five driver results. Ideally, your choices are going to determine the five drivers, which will be listed after clicking the predict button. And note that the, all the X's that you see in the title of this slide, um, that's the same IP that you used uh, at the very beginning uh, to access your Jupyter notebook. Uh, we're just changing that 8001 to 8080, okay? So we're changing 8001 to 8080. And this is something like you should see, this is what you should see on your end after clicking the predict button, not the specific results, right? But, but something like this. Cool, and so now we're gonna give you a little time at the end here to start actually, you know, tinkering with your, with your model. Um, but before that, just some food for thought. On this slide, you can find additional hypotheses if you would like to continue tweaking and playing with your model. And one thing that we really encourage you to do here um, before we wrap up in a minute is just to continue to play with your machine learning model. I know like a lot of people, you know, I learn most when my hands are actually tinkering with the things and getting my hands dirty. And maybe you're the same way. So um, go ahead and take some time to play with your hypotheses and changing some of those variables that we talked about, that Nacho talked about. And we'll check in with you in a few minutes. Here are some of those resources that I know a lot of you have been using, but as you, as you start playing with your model, some new questions might, might arise. And should they arise, go ahead and ask some folks, uh, especially in the Slack group, uh, looks very active, happy to see that. So, Start playing around and I'll check in with you in about 10 or so minutes. All right, have fun.
Hello, hello. Okay, so hopefully you've had some time to play around and hopefully fine tune your model. Maybe you've got some interesting insights. Hopefully, hopefully you did. And to close out, thank you so much for spending part of your day with us. I was really personally encouraged to see so many of you active in the chat and in the Slack learning about machine learning with us. And for now, just a, a really quick plug, um, keep an eye out on Oracle's socials to learn more about the next installment of this series, which will be